Uh, to meet Joe Tobin is, uh, is like being reacquainted with the best friend. Uh, I was reading his autobiography the other day, and uh, it's quite incredible, actually. Uh, uh, Joe was born in 1952 in Detroit. Uh, he's the eldest of 13 children. To be the oldest of 13 is to have a lot of experience at a very young age. And uh, so, so Joe, <laughs> Joe lived widely and deeply uh, his years in Detroit. Uh, he uh, grew up in the parish uh, run by the Redemptorist uh, congregation in Detroit, Holy Redeemer. Uh, he became a member of the community. He did his uh, uh, temporary vows in 1973, his perpetual vows in 76. On June 1st, 78, he was ordained a priest. And uh, on my birthday uh, in 2010, he was made a bishop, October the 9th of 2010. Uh, Joe worked uh, after well, 18 years in community leadership, uh, the last 12 as the Superior General of the Redemptorist Syndrome. Uh, during that time, he attended five of the Episcopal Synods. Uh, he uh, became friends with uh, people like our current Holy Father. Uh, and uh, it's just incredible the number of people that he knows. And his gift, uh, besides uh, uh, a very bright intellect, is uh, to be a deep friend. Uh, and he is friend of, of many, many people. Um, he speaks five languages and understands several others. And uh, if you threw Pig Latin in there, there's probably another one. <laughs> uh, what I enjoy most about Joe, uh, I became, uh, uh, besides being friends and a neighboring pastor, I became the pastor of that parish, his home parish, Holy Redeemer. And that spent very, uh, 12 or 8 satisfying years there before becoming a bishop. Uh, to, to meet uh, Joe is, as I say, uh, to be reacquainted with, with an old friend. And uh, of all his accomplishments in life, uh, he considers uh, uh, being a brother to all uh, one of the most important. And so uh, without further ado, you can read his biography online if you wish. Uh, most important, uh, I introduce you to my brother, Joseph. Thank you, Bishop Don, and uh, thank you for that warm, warm welcome. You know, I always think applause at the beginning of the talk is an act of faith, <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps an act of charity. <laughs> and uh, Don was, certainly was charitable in not going into detail why he had to spend 12 years cleaning up the mess that the former pastor had left him. <laughs> I also worked as a pastor here in Chicago. Used to work honestly in the church, and um, <laughs> I, I still have some friends there. And, uh, <laughs> you're not really big to. And one, one of them wrote to me around uh, Easter to tell me that his son uh, Sam, who is uh, seven years old, I bet baptized, was getting ready for his first communion, and he was becoming quite a, quite interested in church, quite interested in homilies. His dad said that homily that particular Sunday was a little bit confusing for him. He wasn't sure if he quite caught the point. So as they were walking home, he said to Sam, Sam, who do you think Father was talking to today? Was he talking to the kids? Or was he talking to the grown-ups? And Sam thought it over for a moment, and he brightened up and smiled and said, I think he was talking to himself. <laughs> hazard for preachers, <laughs> talking to ourselves. And I think what is going to, gives me confidence that that is not going to happen today, is because I'm not going to use up all the time. There's going to be time when we can talk together. Right. And I'm sure that uh, talking together we're going to find the truth of the matter. But I have to say that uh, I'm comforted by uh, an observation made by a writer named Hugh Carr, who said that all wisdom is plagiarism. Only stupidity is original. <laughs> now, if you use those, that, that criteria, the originality of this presentation might become too covenant quite quickly. But still, I'd like to acknowledge from the very beginning that whatever wisdom might be gleaned in the next uh, 45 minutes or so can be credited to others. 
especially to my friends in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't intend to offer a rigorously scientific presentation. A quick glance at the program for these days reveals that there are others who can, and certainly will, render that valuable service. Essentially, this is a reflection by an alcoholic who, by God's grace and the principles of AA, has not had to take a drink for nearly 26 years, as well as the thoughts of a man who happens to be in his 40th year of religious life and has recently marked 35 years as a priest. My own familiarity with active alcoholism and recovery is a primary source for this reflection. The second source of material is the experience of leadership in the church. The years spent in the general council of my own religious congregation, as well as some service in the Vatican, and most recently in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, where the poor people have been asked to buy a pig and a poke, <laughs> have given me some idea of the struggles of priests and, and religious, as well as the efforts of their superiors to help them. Now, before getting to the heart of the matter of hiking the ball, as one of our professors used to encourage his faint-hearted students, I must admit to a real prejudice. You know, it's an honest program. I'll tell you my prejudice. I refer to the high value that I assign to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I see as the most appropriate and efficient path of recovery for an alcoholic priest or religious. While A never claims to be the sole, the only path to recovery, personally I find it difficult to imagine how people can make it to full sobriety on their own without the benefit of the principles and support of a group that helps them to grow spiritually. I'm glad in my short time in Indianapolis I found a few of those groups. And the group that I call my home group is something that's called TGIF because it meets on Friday night. And uh, most of the folks there know me as Joe. There was one who recognized me and he gave me his card. He said, I think even an archbishop needs a phone number. <laughs> but uh, and I suspect most of the folks there aren't Catholic, you know? And uh, one, of the, one day, one of the, after the Pope Francis' election, uh, one of the, the good old boys said, hey, Joe, you know some guy named Tobin? He was talking on TV about break, about folk? I said, yeah, he's one sick puppy. He should be a meeting <laughs> <laughs> in our personal or vocational issues beyond alcohol, beyond addiction, let me be clear here, many alcoholics do benefit from counseling and should seek counseling and spiritual direction. But in my experience, the daily effort to practice these principles in all our affairs has allowed me, one day at a time, not only to leave behind the hell of active alcoholism, but also to enjoy more than two decades of increasingly happy and productive sobriety. The organizers of the conference asked me to look at a, que at a question as the basis for this presentation. How does alcoholism impact priestly life, ministry, community life, and the efficacy of pastoral care? Now, I have a question. I'm going to make a very modest contribution, I hope. In approaching the question, two standpoints occur to me. First, I would like to speak about the occupational hazards of priests. That is, to reflect on some of the professional circumstances and personal characteristics of priests and male religious. I'm going to speak it, you know, kind of gender specific here, only because I don't presume to speak for women religious who have struggled with addiction. I, I don't have their, their experience, and I haven't listened to many of them. <laughs> but I speak on behalf of the boys, and, and there are circumstances that might ease the slide into active alcoholism and almost certainly serve to cement a shield of denial that, if left intact, will hasten his descent towards incapacitation, insanity, or premature death. The stakes are high. One of my first sponsors said, Joe, the longer you hang around AA, the, long, the, the more you're going to see the people die. And you're not sure why. The second portion of this presentation will offer reasons why superiors and confreres should intervene in the hope of restoring a sick brother to sanity, and why a life-giving project like Guesthouse 
deserves our support. This, there is, the, of course, the imperative of Christian love. But I intend to show you that the provision of a solid, holistic program like that of Guest House can offer the church, her dioceses, and religious families a lot of bang for the buck. Now let me begin with that first standpoint, the occupational hazards of male religious and priests. I begin with a question, are, are priests and religious more prone to alcoholism? Now I have not seen any statistical, uh, or I don't recall seeing a statistical portrait of the percentage of alcoholic priests and religious as compared to alcoholics at large, but my experience, the sort of anecdotal experience of nearly 26 years in AA, leads me to believe that in and of itself, being a priest or religious does not make one more prone to alcoholism. I listen to a lot of people from all different kinds of ways of life that have, uh, have tried the path that I've tried and also found the solution I have. But I do believe there are particular circumstances in the life of a priest or a male religious that can hasten his descent into active alcoholism, especially by providing a rationale that will sustain his increasing abuse of alcohol, while protecting him from honestly accepting the extent to which his life has gone off the rails. What is more, my training may strengthen, his training, my training as well, may strengthen this denial and impede his entrance into a therapeutic program <laughs> or AA. I believe that ignorance of these pernicious building blocks in the wall of denial will serve to accelerate his increasing incapacitation once again, leading to permanent disability and premature death. It is important, however, to emphasize that alcoholics who happen to be priests or religious are not an entirely unique species among those who suffer from this chronic, progressive, and in a left untreated fatal disease. The wisdom of AA counsels against any alcoholic seeing himself or herself as being terminally unique. The language of the 12 steps employs the first person plural form of the verb, testifying to the fact that alcoholics have faced a common peril and have found a common solution. On the other hand, the initial inspiration of Austin Ripley acknowledged that the special nature of religious life, as experienced by priests, brothers, deacons, and seminarians, requires special personalized attention which honors not only their human dignity, but their calling and commitment as well. Those of you who are familiar with the history of Guest House will recall that its founder, Austin Ripley, was motivated by his strong Catholic faith, as well as personal gratitude for his own daily reprieve from the insanity of active alcoholism. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, Riff, as he was known, noted with concern the apparent failure of AA to reach and hold alcoholic priests. They would come and they would go, and disappear, and frequently die. Recognizing this particular need, Rip set in motion an institution that has contributed to the lasting sobriety of the vast majority of the more than 6,000 priests and religious that have been guests of Lake Orion or Rochester, Minnesota since 1956. Now what do you suppose can grease the skids for a priest or a brother? What are some of the features of a clerical culture that might make it easier for a priest or religious who is predisposed to addictive behavior to toboggan down the slippery slope of al active alcoholism. Two manifestations are worthy of mention. The first is the central role that alcohol has played in the lives of priests and religious in many parts of the world. Preprandial happy hours and late night drinking sessions form part of the daily routine of the first communities in which I lived. An obligatory happy hour was an important feature of most clerical gatherings. Of course, the majority of clerics do not find that easy access and frequent exposure to alcohol poses any problem whatsoever for them. 
For some of us, however, the availability of booze, together with a tacit blessing to imbibe daily, proved to be, at the beginning, a well-deserved reward, then a daily requirement, and finally, a deadly obsession. Although I've lived outside the country for most of the past two decades, I have the impression that today alcohol is less central to the culture of priests and religious in the United States. Parties, provincial chapters, assemblies, and other gatherings of clerics and religious no longer appear to be occasions for heavy drinking. An observation which leads me to ask a soul-disturbing question. Is it possible the guest house has successfully rounded up the last of us drunks? <laughs> Don't think so. There's another characteristic of clerical culture that I believe still provides a matrix in which all sorts of unhealthy behaviors may flourish. I refer to the anonymity of priestly and religious life, yes. built on an ethic of politeness that allows pathological manifestations to progress relatively unchecked. By the time a competent authority becomes aware of the severity of the problem, the afflicted person is already in the grip of a full-blown alcoholism or other types of addiction. And this is nothing new. 250 years ago, Voltaire, the French essayist, and a savage critic of priestly and religious life, observed that monks were, quote, men who bunched together without knowing each other, lived together without loving each other, and died together without mourning for each other. Certainly not every religious community or diocesan or presbytery can be so roundly caricatured. Nevertheless, the magisterium of the Catholic Church recognizes that superficial communication and a faceless lifestyle can still be a problem for priests and religious. A remark once made to me by a friend and fellow patient at guest house that helped illustrate this problem. One morning as we left a group session of group therapy, John C. turned to me and said, Joe, all this business about sharing really is frustrating for me. I don't know how to do it. Years ago, when I got to my first assignment, an old confer pulled me aside and offered me some advice. In this house, don't tell nobody nothing, unless the guy's wearing a stole. Now, Father John was gifted enough to be appointed a university president. But outside of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, was reluctant to speak in community about anything of personal nature. Our friendship revealed that he was not reticent by nature, but learned such caution as a requirement for community life. John C. went back out and died prematurely, and I still pray for him. An anonymous community life founded on superficial and deficient communication can exacerbate an occupational hazard of priests and religious, what Pope John Paul II termed a sort of loneliness, which is the product of various difficulties and which in turn creates more difficulties. The traditional reluctance of communities of men to speak openly about their problems can pursue a confrere even after his death. The province in which I spent the first two decades of my religious life has a really lovely custom each morning and morning prayer of reading a short biography of the brother or priest who died on that day, and then the community prays for that person. As a young priest, I was struck by the account of gifted men, some of whom I knew personally, who died after a long and futile struggle with alcoholism. In their biographies, the cause of death was never mentioned, unlike the cause of others, who had, in the case of others, who had waged a heroic fight before succumbing to a more acceptable malady, like cancer or heart disease. Now that last point leads me to think a little bit about some rivers, beginning with the question of denial. Because <laughs> we know that denial is not just a river in Egypt. 
a great friend of Guest House, uh, Dr. Ernie Kurtz, offers, uh, tells of a moment of illumination that came one day during a visit to Lake, the Lake Orion facility. And if you were in treatment there in the 80s and 90s, you'll know whom he's talking about. Ernie writes, shortly after my arrival, the house director came down to my office and with a twinkle in his eye, asked in his resonant Irish tenor, uh, Dr. Kurtz, would you like to have a reputation as being wonderfully wise? Of course, I answered, smiling back at the ruddy-faced Celt. Anyone would want such a reputation. Tell me, Ed, how? Well, a resident genius replied, as you may suspect, not all of our men make it on the first try. Some of them try a wee sip of the creature again and so eventually end up back here. And because I am the director, they come to me to be interviewed as they are readmitted. And when they do, I start off by asking them two questions. And oh, they think I'm so wise that I can see into their very souls. After a maddeningly long pause, Ed continued. The first question I ask, of course, is, when did you stop going to meetings? And the second question I ask them is, and what are you hiding? Denial is not simply hiding things from others. More insidious even is the attempt to deceive oneself. Denial is so characteristic a feature of the disease that it is said that alcoholism is the only disease that tries to convince you that you don't have it. An adage from the popular wisdom of AA observes, I wasn't an alcoholic until I stopped drinking. <laughs> like other alcoholics, a priest or religious who suffers from this disease must construct and maintain a system of denial that will permit him to continue drinking by shielding him from the reality of the de de deteriorating life. I think as men, an important thread in the web of denial is that the perception that we are still performing our duties even working harder than our peers. I recall a conversation with a chancellor from a Canadian diocese who was finishing his treatment at Lake Orion when I arrived in October of 1987. The Monsignor related how he used to scowl disapprovingly at other priests of the chancery who took Wednesday afternoons off to play golf. And our Monsignor thought to himself, I'll show those lazy bastards I work. Sometime during his stay at guest house, a new thought occurred to him. <laughs> Those fellows are still playing golf on Wednesday afternoons, and here I am in a treatment facility. <laughs> <laughs> Who showed what to whom? <clears throat> I came to learn a similarly humiliating truth. One day in group therapy, we were asked to talk about our work. Uh, trolling for sympathy from others, which is one of my favorite pastimes. <laughs> I, I complained how, as the pastor of a sprawling inner city parish, one that Don knows too well, I never came off duty. The phone rang day and night. It was usually for me, and rarely was the caller interested in whether or not I was having a nice day. <laughs> Instead of sympathy, I earned a question from the counselor, Father Tobin. Have you ever thought that you worked the way that you did so that you could drink the way that you did? Of course, I've been telling myself I was zealously spending my life in service of others. But that claim had become largely defense against recognizing by increasing this obsession with alcohol. Our work, the misunderstanding of family and colleagues, loneliness, guilt, anger, frustration, a love life that's in the toilet, all these can and do provide the raw materials for constructing and reinforcing denial. I can appreciate the lament of an Irishman, everyone complains about my drinking, but nobody asks about my thirst. Denial spins the reasons to justify slaking that thirst with a substance that is destroying us. <coughs> In my experience, if one presses a priest or religious to explain why he is abusing alcohol, the response is fundamentally the same. If you had my life, you'd drink too. 
The grace of God and the love of our brothers and sisters can pierce the web of denial. A crisis can lead us to see what we have become, as well as our own powerlessness to extricate ourselves from the mess. We might achieve what is called in AA, the grace of desperation, to know that I have nowhere else to go. So we try to leave behind denial and search for another river. The second book of Kings relates the healing of a man who was stricken with an incurable disease. Although successful in his chosen profession, all his accomplishments meant little in the face of the disfigurement caused by his relentless disease, which threatened finally to separate him from family and society. The man was Amun, a Syrian general, renowned for his courage. He was also a lover. At the urging of a young captain, Amun decided to visit the prophet Elisha and arrived at the door of the holy man within a splash of military might with gifts to curry his favor. The prophet did not come out to meet the man. Instead, he sent a message to his distinguished visitor. Go and wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will heal, and you will be clean. The Amun angrily rejects such a mundane solution, protesting, I thought that he would surely come out and stand there to invoke the Lord as God and remove his hand over the spot and thus cure the leprosy. Besides, sneers our general, our streams back home are better than any old Jordan River. Now you remember how the story ends. His servants pers persuade the general to keep it simple and follow what is suggested. The result? His flesh became again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And Naaman the, the Syrian came to believe. A good number of alcoholic priests and religious have a hard time sticking with AA. Some are fearful or ashamed to be recognized by the parishioners or others at a meeting. I found this attitude especially prevalent in Latin America and Eastern Europe. Others are flocked by a sort of clericalism and spiritual superiority. Like Naaman invoking the merits of the rivers of Damascus, these brothers find it difficult to adhere to AA because of its apparent simplicity. They protest that their own spiritual regimen is enough. After listening to such objections, I sometimes quote the wisdom of Mother Annabelle, a wizened African-American matriarch who used to open an AA meeting every Sunday evening in a storefront church in the inner city of Pontiac, Michigan. Mother Annabelle would slip, smile sweetly at the assembly and announce, my name is Annabelle and I am an alcoholic. On Sunday mornings, I go to church to save my soul. On Sunday evenings, I come to AA to save my dirty air. <laughs> Actually, not known to speak French, that Mother Annabelle would use a shorter word to describe <laughs> the object of salvation. The crisis, subsequent surrender, and healing journey that marked the passage of a priest or religious from active alcoholism to recovery may help him overcome one of the most treacherous, treacherous hazards of the clerical caste. I refer, of course, to the study of theology. The danger faced by many priests and religious, and not simply those who are alcoholic, is that their intense academic formation risks reducing God to an object of study. If one is not aware of this hazard, theology is no longer in the classic definition of St. Anselm, faith seeking understanding, but a sort of divine trivial pursuit, that is, knowing a great deal about God, but not knowing God. I wonder if this occupational hazard is not experienced more painfully by priests and religious in the throes of active alcoholism. God reveals God's own life as a person, not an object, and as such seeks to meet us in a personal manner. 
A disease which wreaks such havoc on personal relationships cannot be weakened, can, excuse, cannot help but distort the spiritual life of an alcoholic. A dimension that might already be weakened by the prior transformation of the other into an object of study. I was struck by a quote in uh, the recent encyclical, Luna Fide, the, uh, where Pope Francis and following certainly the lead of, of Pope uh, Benedict, cites Martin Buber's definition of idolatry. That is, when a face addresses another face which is not a face. I heard early on in AA that there were only two things that I absolutely had to know about God. The rest of it we could debate. First, there is one. And secondly, that it's not me. <laughs> what is worse, denial, a typical feature of alcoholism, has also transformed the alcoholic into something else. A man behind a mask. Or a lot of the heroine of a wonderful novel by C.S. Lewis, Till We Have Faces, captures the dilemma when she asks, how can the gods meet us until we have a face? Alcoholism and its subsequent denial to preserve it keeps the priest from having a face. And God does not want to speak to a mask. On the other hand, let me speak about the perks. It's good to be a priest. It reminds me of a commercial that I believe the Bishop's Conference in the United States forced the religious order to take off out of a magazine back in the 1980s. It uh, showed the famous, um, who was the cleric on the Smothers Brothers? Guido Sarducci. Guido Sarducci, the famous Guido Sarducci, <laughs> sitting with a fork and knife in front of a big pile of pasta, and, and the caption was, eat free at Italian restaurants. <laughs> I lived in Rome for 20 years, and I never got a freebie. <laughs> but I must say that, that there are real advantages to being a priest or religious if one is locked in combat with alcoholism. Let me cite two. First, I presume that most of us are attracted to this way of life by certain ideals, as well as a spiritual hunger or thirst. And it's not accidental that booze is called spirits. Carl Jung once noted in the letter to Bill W., a co-founder of AA, that alcoholics in seeking spiritus fermenti, the spirit of the, the fermented spirit, was at, were actually seeking spiritus dei, the spirit of God. The letter was reprinted in the 1963 January edition of Grapevine, the AA magazine. Granted, the disease can be fuddled belief, and many compromises brought about by alcoholic behavior badly tarnish ideals. But the grace of recovery does not transport you to an alien nirvana. Rather, sobriety holds the promise of allowing you to realize your deepest ideals the dreams through which God first spoke in the depths of our hearts. So sobriety is a lot like coming home. Another plus for a priest is, as he confronts the truth of his alcoholism, is that the leadership of dioceses and religious congregations by and large is enlightened and compassionate and will offer him generous support and understanding. I might say, however, that this is not the case in every national or local church. There are cultures in the world in which alcoholism is seen exclusively as a moral failing. And I've visited communities in my own religious family in other countries where a suffering convert is deliberately isolated or punished with useless sanctions. And even when a superior in Eastern Europe, Africa, or Asia earnestly wants to help an addicted convert, he does not know what to do or where to turn. So we ought to applaud the outreach of guest house, and this outreach that has been realized outside of North America and beyond Euro-American culture. Such efforts to carry the message in Eastern Europe, supporting the treatment center in South India, as well as initiatives among Hispanic clergy 
and religious, foreign born religious in the United States. We must also be grateful for members of AA across the world who seek to carry the message even to suffering priests and brothers. I remember visiting a community of religious in Belarus, one of the former republics of the Soviet Union, where alcoholism is endemic. Many workers are paid on a great collective farms in vodka. And they'll receive five bottles on Friday, and many of them go home and drink themselves to death over the weekend. So I ask the religious, what are you doing to help these people? And they said, we don't bury them from the church. <laughs> I said, that's great, you punish the family. Oh, what are you doing for the people who are still alive? I said, have you ever heard of AA? And a number of them were Polish. They said, yeah, we heard about it in Poland. I said, get them here, bring them here. Which they did, and they established some of the first groups in the rural uh, areas of, of Belarus. What is the return on the investment that a diocese or a congregation might make in a sick priest or brother? Now, I suspect this final part of uh, my presentation is like preaching to the choir. I never say in conclusion, because someone wants to find second wind is what happens when a redemptor says in conclusion. <laughs> I, mean, I think I'm preaching to the choir. I presume you're here <laughs> because you're, you're participating in this conference because you've seen how addiction ravages the individual, his community, and the people he wants to serve. You strive to understand better the soul-searing effects of alcoholism and to appreciate the incredible liberation of an addict in recovery. The motto of my religious family comes from Psalm 130. With him, there is abundant redemption. Copios him redemptio. I said, any redemptors that's in recovery doesn't have to ask what abundant means. We experience it. With regard to the last point, the addict in recovery, let me briefly reflect with you on a few questions. First, why bother? Then, what can be expected from a priest or religious in recovery? Or put it another way, what's the return on your investment? Why bother? <coughs> it is enlightening to note that each of the three world great or three of the great world religions, commonly and perhaps erroneously referred to as religions of the book, assign far-reaching consequences to the act of saving the life of a single person. Judaism teaches that he who saves the life of another has saved the entire world while Islam characterizes the rescue of another as saving the life of the whole people. Christianity teaches an even more radical imperative. In Jesus, God identifies himself with those to whom service is given or refused. And our behavior towards others is our behavior towards God. Amen, I say to you. Whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. An intervention done in tough love and the ongoing support of the brother in recovery is not simply visiting the imprisoned, but preparing the visit of the Lord who comes to set captives free. In the secular language of AA, preparing the way of the Lord is called carrying the message. But as alcoholics tell each other, carry the message, but recognize one's limitations. You can carry the message, but you can't carry the alcoholic. This affirmation is more than simply bound to solve the conscience of a bishop or religious superior who has patiently made multiple interventions in the life of the sick priest or brother, only to be frustrated by his manipulation or stubborn refusal to see what is evident to everyone else. The love of Christ urges us to do something, but we cannot control the results. My first sponsor in AA, a wonderful Jesuit by the name of Joe H., told me about a conversation he had with his own first sponsor. Joe, by the way, my friend, was a brilliant professor of higher mathematics, a national science scholar, and highly skilled in information technology. His sponsor, on the other hand, 
was a good old boy from West Virginia who probably had never finished grade school. Yet when they first met, the good old boy was doing something that seemed absolutely impossible to the professor. He was staying sober one day at a time. <laughs> now the gentleman from Appalachia decided to be straight with Joe from the very start. He said, boy, I want you to know that of the first 11 fellows I sponsored, six of them killed themselves. Sometimes after not hearing from one or the other, I went over to his place and I found him dangling from the pipe or with his brains splattered on the wall. Joe wondered if he hadn't made a serious error. <laughs> and he gulped and asked, then why do you keep sponsoring people? The sponsor was evident, because I have to carry the message. What they do with it, what you do with it, is up to you and up to God. Why bother? Because we must carry the message. We who are grateful drunks who don't have to drink today, and we who believe that the concern we show towards others, especially towards those who are least, is finally concern for the suffering face of God. The lifestyle and quality of ministry of an, of an alcoholic priest or religious can be a boon to his diocese or congregation. Once again, I do not believe that it is enough for us to simply be dry, but progressing in a sober life. Hence, the strong recommendation for ongoing and active participation in the fellowship of AA. A terrifying revelation for many newly sober alcoholics is the insistence of AA on the necessity of a spiritual experience or spiritual awakening as an absolute recover, uh, condition for ongoing recovery. I remember the first time I read that in the big book when I was in my first weeks at guest house, I was absolutely terrified. I said, I don't do spiritual experiences. <laughs> for not a few, the idea of depending on God for anything is a dubious, if not entirely offensive, proposition. The claim of the spiritual basis of recovery was so easily misunderstood <laughs> that following the publication of the first edition of the so-called Big Book about AA, the authors felt the need to include a special appendix on the nature of a spiritual experience. I read that appendix and it calm me down. Newly sober priests and religious might not share the same antipathy towards the mention of a higher power that other alcoholics do. But there's a reasonable chance that many will arrive with their own objections, either because they are awash in guilt and shame, or because God has been little more than a distant and unfriendly concept. Such dispositions will pass as the individual comes to believe that Far from being his personal triumph, sobriety is actually a gift. He will sense that God, the God he read about or prayed to, is actually doing for him what he cannot do for himself. In the deliverance from the agonizing chaos of active alcoholism, the spirit offers the individual an experience of God. It does. It is an indescribable and inexplicable feeling of inner security, which can only, one can only experience, but once it is experienced, one can never forget it. The sober priest and religious knows that his Redeemer lives. The principles of AA, far from providing a private path that leads a priest or brother into an esoteric cult, actually serves as an entree or catalyst for growth in the spiritual patrimony of his, the priesthood or his congregation or the sacrament of orders. As they work the 12 steps, Jesuits have little difficulty in recognizing the dynamics of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. A redemptress will gain new insight into the fundamental role that St. Alphonsus assigns to conformity with the will of God. This access to spirituality is not built on a theoretical understanding of rules, but rather as an eagerness to continue to grow spiritually, as well as the confidence that such growth is in fact possible. At the heart of this confidence is the seminal experience of release from alcoholism, which is appreciated finally as an experience of the saving power of God. 
of St. Paul, the recovering priest, the religious might ask, what then shall we say of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not also give us everything along with him? This experience of God and sobriety leads the individual to a greater selflessness and gratitude. The experience also engenders humility, which allows one to walk a realistic course between the beast and the angel by recognizing clearly what and who we are, followed by a sincere attempt to become what we could be. And finally, this experience of God as the author and guarantor of one's sobriety usually produces a greater tolerance of others, which can be invaluable means for discovering community. I remember early on going to a weekly meeting in Allen Park, Michigan, outside Detroit, and uh, there was a fellow that invariably sat at my table, you know, and the, the rubric was the meeting was supposed to last an hour. He would talk for about 45 minutes, beginning by saying, you know, I went to five meetings this morning, and we're going to go three tonight, and then he would say what he's going to say, and after 45 minutes, get up and leave, and I wanted to tear his tonsils up. <laughs> and I told my sponsor of that bias project, and he said, maybe he's there so you can learn to be tolerant. <laughs> my brothers and sisters, for more than 20 years, my mailing address was someplace in Rome. When I'm visiting people in other countries or pushing papers in the Vatican, I try to make time to explore the wonders of the Eternal City. And if you ask me what's your favorite spot, I'd have to say the catacombs. I recommend a visit to any of the catacombs. In these subterranean labyrinths, one can glimpse the art and symbols of our mothers and fathers in faith. Christ is placed as the predominant character, no surprise. What the Sacred Heart is for many Catholics today, namely the symbol of Christ's love, the Good Shepherd was for the ancient Christians. The Savior is often represented at work among them. On the bas reliefs or on the walls, we see Jesus who touches the eyes of the blind man or raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus who multiplies the bread or changes the water into wine. It's always the same Christ who goes about doing good. And then there are symbols that you see in the, in the Catechism. The most significant are the ones in which Christ does not appear in human form, but under the veil of a symbol, such as the fish, and later the kiro. If you're an attentive visitor, you will note the absence of our most familiar Christian symbol. In the oldest sections of the Catacombs, you will see no clear representation of the cross. Before Constantine, when the cross was daily used as a gallows for slaves and foreigners, the Christians disguised the repulsive symbol aspect through symbols such as the anchor. Now what changed in order to introduce the cross into Christian art and iconography? The disappearance of public crucifixion certainly made the symbol more palatable to Christians. But I wonder if the lived experience of life in the Spirit did not make Christians more open to embracing the scandal of the cross. The scandal described by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The cross demonstrates the power of God to bring life out of appalling suffering and apparent defeat. The cross reminds us that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Guest House has its own iconography, which includes representations of the Archangel Raphael, as well as a curious logo that dates to the first days of the Lake Orient facility. You'll find it in your folder on uh, one of the pages. You've seen it all, seen it before. It's an ensemble that, depending on the point of view, suggests either two hands supporting a head bowed in despair, or the same hands raising a cup of thanksgiving. I believe that the symbol captures very well the reality of Guest House 
and like the cross, reminds one of the loving power of a saving God. This is the mystery that is celebrated in the Holy Eucharist. And it is fitting that a graduate of Guest House closes this reflection, a grateful graduate, with the imagery of the raised cup and the grateful words of the sun. Since the grace of God experienced at Lake Orion so many years ago has made it possible for me to continue to celebrate the Eucharist and to progress in the Eucharistic way of life. How can I repay the Lord for all the good he has done for me? I will raise the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Thank you very much. When I was drinking, and I realized it afterwards, I, as well, alcohol was like the thread that held it all together in my mind. And if you pulled on that, the whole thing would come apart. You know? So I think you can expect that the priest is going to be defensive. He's not going to say, oh my gosh, thank you. you know, I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I think it's important to do it, if possible, with several people. I mean, the wisdom of AA has always been the so-called 12-step calls, where we go to visit a suffering alcoholic, has always done the two. Because alcoholics are marvelously manipulative. And many a person that tried to do an intervention by themselves walked away and said, oh my gosh, it was my problem after all. <laughs> so, so the alcoholic has, has done what he needed to do. He's can, can, I remember one of our, uh, in our, in our Irish province, the, the poor provincial at the time, a lovely guy, a brilliant moral theologian, but he had a couple of personal peculiarities. He had a little tick, you know, as he kind of did this, you know, and one eye kind of went off this way. So he, he looked a little bit different, and one of the <coughs> conferences had disappeared, and there were sightings of him up and down the west coast of Ireland. And they finally, he got, Father Rayfield got a phone call and said, we think your priest is in our hospital. I said, well, are you sure it was a priest? We think so because he was dressed in a black suit with a clerical collar, sitting on a load of cabbages with a bottle of gin waving to people as he went into the hospital. <laughs> so, so the provincial said, keep him there. I'm on my way. So he jumps in his car and drives across Ireland, which is not as hard as the big south of the big country. When he got there, it was the change of shift. And the nurses coming on knew that there was one priest who was severely toxic and was going to be kept in the locked ward. So they saw our fellow like kind of put him in the and say, come this way, Father. He said, no, no, I'm fine. They all say that, Father. <laughs> <laughs> and our boy who came in our cabbages was waving. <laughs> and this was like his dream come true. <laughs> Potential of getting locked up. <laughs> so I think you can expect there's going to be some resistance. But I, I think if you talk, if you don't have a, access to a treatment facility, you do because you're here at Guest House or any of the other groups who would be more than happy, I think, to, to help you do an intervention.